Our speaker tonight is Cody Heichel. And Cody is an Ohio-based painter. His work is about how we see the world around us, whether that's the houses we see on our daily walk or um, sometimes the city of Columbus through the windshield of his car. He's represented by Grant Roberts Gallery in Columbus. And um, Cody, welcome. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It, is the volume okay? Am I coming through all right? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I made uh, kind of a just a PowerPoint presentation to go along uh, as I as I talk. So let me share my screen real quick and pull that up. And is that working for everybody? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. There we go. All right. So my name is Cody Heichel. I am uh, currently living in Cleveland, Ohio, but I was um, living in Columbus, Ohio for uh, the better part of 10 years. Um, I, I just wanted to give you an idea. So for today, I decided that I wanted to make a, a presentation um, essentially uh, talking about my interests and what has led me to creating the work that I'm that I'm making, and not throughout the history of the work I'm making, but kind of the work that I've been focused on for the last um, couple of years. Uh, so, uh, the general theme, if there is one, is about um, learning a visual language and also influence, and and how influence works and how it affects us, and and how we work positively with um, with our influences. Um, uh, but first I figured I would just give you a, a very quick, brief background on myself and then kind of get going with that. Um, let's see. Oh. All right. Uh, I, first I want to start off on the, uh, on the idea of influence. One of my favorite quotes from the beloved Wayne Tebow. Everything I do, I stole from someone else. And if you're not careful, I'll steal from you. Um, so my name, again, is Cody Heichel. I was born in Worcester, Ohio. My parents, uh, Linda and Steve, were antique dealers and still are. Now they're retired and they're back to antiques. Uh, but for a period there, my mother was a librarian and my father worked in a recycling plant in Ashland, Ohio where I worked with him for several years myself um, in my early 20s. Um, I have an older brother, Jessup, who I always looked up to and looked up to very much art artistically. He was five years older than me and he was an excellent drawer and artist. And, um, and so my interests when I was a little kid, uh, I would emulate him a lot and I would emulate uh, him taking time to draw, and that was certainly a part of my life. But really, my main interest when I was a, younger was basketball, um, and uh, so that was kind of my main passion. But I've looked back and kind of realized that throughout all the different phases of my life, which went from basketball to music to visual art, kind of the undercurrent of it all, creativity always played a really important role. So even in with basketball, I was a little more interested in uh, coming up with like ball handling tricks, like the globe trotters, than I was like actually playing organized basketball. Here's the proof. There you go. That's me spinning two balls at once. So take that in. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so as I pivoted out of playing basketball, I, I started playing music and that became a, a, a creative outlet for me for a long time, um, up until about the age of 26, when I took an interest in watercolor. Um, I had taken some art classes throughout high school um, and it was always on the periphery, 
and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't really my focus. Um, it was just something that I enjoyed much more than everything else in high school. So, uh, and then uh, as I got to around the age of 26, I was moving from my hometown of Worcester to, Cle or to Columbus uh, to uh, live with my now wife, Marcella. So I was looking for something that I could do more individually. Music was more of a group um, thing for me, um, playing in bands and stuff. And so I wanted to still have an outlet, uh, a creative outlet. And so I started taking an interest in watercolor. And I began um, taking classes in Worcester uh, when I could, um, taking workshops and things like that. Uh, in 2011, I began working at a art studio in Columbus called Open Door Art Studio, which is an art studio for adults with disabilities. And I worked there for six years and um, took a lot away from that uh, up until 2017 when I decided to become uh, a full-time artist and pursue that and have been doing that since. Uh, in 2018, I welcomed my first child, Olavo, and, and this year I welcomed my second child, Eloisa. And I'm currently living in Cleveland. And that is the quickest catch up of who I am <laughs> and how I got here. Um, so I'm starting on this painting. Uh, so I, I will eventually get to showing um, some, some more of my work, um, but I figured for the purposes of this, I wanted to kind of first, uh, well, first show you a piece of my work and then go through influences and the things that excite me and then come back around and show you the things I'm working on. And then in the end, just open up for some questions. And I'll try, try hard not to drag on for too long on a lot of these things. But this piece um, was kind of important to me. This was um, just down the road from the house that my wife and I bought in Columbus. It's on um, Fifth uh, Avenue, uh, kind of between Neal and High Street. Um, and this piece kind of represents the work that I had been doing for many years and, and the work that I was, I've been kind of working through in the last couple of years. This piece feels kind of like a, a midway point for me almost. And so in that way, uh, I feel like even though I made this um, in 2020, it still feels kind of like a, the most representative of my entire body of work that, that I could kind of present in a single picture. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, like I made this and, I, and it was one of those times where I was, I was happy with what happened. And, and then I think I should just focus on doing more work that's like this, but it doesn't always work that way. Like you make a piece and then you really, I think, and I found that I don't have, it doesn't feel like a choice of what I'm working on next. It, I, I just, I am able to show up in the space where I'm working, focus on whatever is exciting me and work for as long as I can work. And what it comes of it comes of it. So I can't really control exactly what's being made. So, um, but I figured that was a good place to start. Um, so I wanted to start with, as I said, um, just kind of talking through the work that has been interesting to me and exciting to me throughout the last few years um, to kind of give indication of, of where I've been kind of heading with my work. And through that, hopefully maybe there's some lessons um, that can come through that I've gleaned from a lot of these paintings that I've been looking at uh, from other historic artists and contemporary artists. And even if it's not stylistically something that you yourself are interested in, I hope that, I think that most lessons can, um, you know, can mean the same across all different styles, all different mediums um, and, and so on. So hopefully pull away some of the ideas that I got from these paintings. Um, and so I just wanted to go through a set of paintings and kind of describe what they meant to me and, and what I took away from them. Uh, so I'm gonna start with an artist named Gael Scalia. Um, this painting, I think, um, mostly to me, conveys the importance and, and how wonderful it is when you can 
really say more with less and get it across in so few shapes and so few brush strokes, but very slowly placed and well thought out. Um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite paintings. Um, and I think that here she she's said so much with these small shapes um, that are all intertwining together um, with this wall that's uh, kind of sitting right in front of the subject. But if you just look at that wall for a couple seconds, you can see that it doesn't really stay put on the same color for too long, but yet it's the, the shifts are all very subtle. Um, but it's enough to make it not feel too flat. Um, and just all the interesting shapes that are happening uh, within the, the building structure and the trees and the little bits that you can't even necessarily identify what they are, uh, but they're all really well planned out. And so that painting to me is, has always been pretty special. Um, this is an artist, another one of my favorite artists, Clarice Beckett. She, I would say, has kind of flown under the radar and I, I came across her, um, if you if you don't ever use Pinterest, I highly recommend Pinterest for uh, uh, especially for artists you, because the beautiful thing about it is it's image based and it you know it it can be a little scary but it learns what you like and it sees what you're interested in and you can save all these images and create these folders and I was looking up probably Matisse or somebody and then it was like suggested her and she turned into a really big portal for me. I, I've spent a lot of time studying her work. Um, what this painting told me when I saw it was that, uh, this is a subject that I have had painted uh, over and over and painted it to death, it was a rainy scene, a rainy road. Um, and I had started to get a little um, turned off to doing it. I felt like maybe it was becoming a little predictable and I, I don't know I just I was losing confidence in, in painting the scene like that and then I saw this painting and it just like struck me over the head that that any scene can be interesting depending on how it's painted and she just painted this in such an interesting way and there's so many great choices down to the the red tail light on the on the right um, juxtaposed to the, the yellowish orange lamp on the left, um, instead of using two taillights even, just the choice to have one, maybe it's like a blinker, who knows, it doesn't matter, because all that matters is if she had done two, I know that your eye would have been drawn completely to that car and locked in a lot more, but with just one, now it kind of balances everything out, and you're kind of free to explore the space in between. Um, and all these beautiful blues that are happening between there and that really gray sky. Uh, I just absolutely love this painting. She was a, um, she was an Australian artist. She was one of the artists who never saw success in her time. And actually most of her work was kept in a um, shed that later was discovered and most of her work had been just destroyed by the elements. And then she later on went on to become a, a national treasure in Australia. But you just have to indulge me for a second uh, as I um, try to find, see if I can find it. Um, there was, um, yeah. I, I just like to trumpet her as much as I can and promote her as much, because I, I just really, love and believe in her work and her story was pretty sad but um they talk a lot about the um the prejudice and uh the misogyny that she was up against certainly at her time uh in the late 1800s early 1900s as a female artist um uh and in a review this is a real review that someone wrote um and I apologize for any feelings that it could um, create, but I, this is what she was up against. Someone wrote of her work, a, uh, a male columnist, men and women are differently constituted. Women are more closely attached to the physical things of life and to expect them to do some things equally as well as men is sheer lunacy. A great artist has to tread a lonely road. 
he becomes great only by exerting himself to the limit of his strength the whole time. I believe such a life is unnatural and impossible for a woman. Wow. So that's um, what she was up against. And so, uh, you know, I just like to um, kind of promote her work as much as I can because I just believe in it so much. I just think it's, she's one of my favorite painters ever. So look her up, Clarice Beckett. It's a, a sad story, but uh, endless amounts of beautiful work. Uh, I'll try it, that's another one of her pieces. One of the best beach scenes I think I've ever seen. Um, I'll try to kind of continue on a little more quickly now. Um, Tom Thompson, if any of you are familiar with the group of seven in Canada, um, I was fortunate enough to see this piece in person uh, in Ontario. Uh, and, and to me, this painting uh, just says a lot about how um, vivid and like the vividness of color that someone can use. And yet in the end, it still comes across muted somehow. When you really get up close and look at the palette and what he was using, it's these really intense hues but yet somehow it all balances out so well. And he was really a master at that. Um, Edward Vuillard is uh, uh, another favorite. This one I think is called The Green Room, rightfully so. Um, but this one just told me a lot about texture, um, shapes, allowing shapes into a painting that it doesn't matter if you can tell exactly what's happening as long as it's serving a purpose. Uh, like some of those green shapes at the bottom, uh, that one in the center uh, that really pushes the figure who's kind of knitting or you know doing something with her hands in the corner. Um, so just so many interesting shapes and so much happening here. Um, but also, and the picture doesn't do it justice, but how it's painted, it's beautifully painted. Um, Another favorite is Albert York. Um, he, something that I, I, I have a book by him and I, he did like one, one interview his whole life. He was pretty solitary, uh, but something that struck me, or it, sometimes people give you ideas that are novel to you, you've never thought of them. And then sometimes they like can reassure you of something that you've been doing and that maybe you didn't feel very confident about. And that's what happened with this was that he said his process was, was that he would go and he would sit in nature and he would start a painting. But in the end, he was almost disconnected from it and he would change things around, add things that weren't even there. Uh, he felt total freedom just to start somewhere. And then in the end, it wasn't even close to what he was actually looking at. And that started happening with me in my work. And I felt like I wasn't sure how I felt about it. Um, and then I read that and it helped kind of, um, you know, it's like it sent in a little backup to be like, it's okay, just do your process. Um, and there's no right or wrong. Um, uh, he was known for scraping down his, his uh, panels, like he would paint something, scrape it back down to wood, start again over and over and over, never satisfied us with, with his work. Uh, and one of his, uh, someone who, who had written the book, um, one of the quotes was, in art, you never hit what you're aiming at, but the difference may not be downward, uh, which, you know, says that I certainly am someone who can get in my head about a piece and feel like it didn't live up to exactly what I wanted, but that sometimes it's okay. The difference isn't downward. Maybe it's okay. Maybe I, I don't need to scrape this one all the way back and I can just let it be and see if, you know, it finds its way somewhere along the way. With, you know. So I appreciated that. Uh, Matisse, he's a big one. Um, a quote from Matisse, details detract. Um, and you certainly see him live by that mantra in his work. Um, the way that he simplified things, but still remained, you still felt like it was tethered to reality, um, but it was that really beautiful um, space between abstraction and realism. Um, one of my favorite things about this painting is that, I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, scrolling around or not, probably not, you, you can. 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Is uh, that's helpful to know? Is that clearly this is peering out of like a second story, third story window, and here is the the railing, but here used to be the railing, uh, and instead of trying to cover up those marks, it's just still in there, and I love that. <laughs> Uh, I, it's like evidence of changes and letting that be a part of the painting. Um, I think there's just a freedom there that I certainly wouldn't have allowed for quite a while in my own work. And now, uh, you know, you see some things and it's almost like giving you a license to let those things happen in your own work. So, uh, I love this painting for that reason. Kind of similarly, um, but in a different manner. Uh, this is a Fairfield Porter painting. And uh, with a David Hockney quote, the moment you cheat for the sake of beauty, you know you're an artist. Um, so what that says to me here is when you look at the painting, uh, you know, you have this path leading down to some, some water and some things uh, happening in the back and your eye lands somewhere in here, I'd say. But he's made the marks of the water go right over top of where there's trees and shrubberies are like, clearly this does not happen in the real world but what it's doing is serving a purpose if all these dark shapes here are solid your eye isn't really going to go past it quite as easily as it does uh and in in that sense it almost feels um like he was after you know often if you're peering out at a lake you can see foliage and things in front of you in the foreground, but you're looking past it. And what he did with his brush here is allow you to look past it. Um, and that's a cheat. That is not how this, this scene is, but yet in a, in a way it's almost more what it is. So uh, I thought that that was a lesson that I took away from that painting. Uh, Giorgio Morandi is another favorite. Um, uh, I think the thing about Morandi that has had the biggest effect on me is uh, surprise. Uh, I don't think there are many people who would think to arrange these objects in this manner. And these compositions are just so surprising to me. And it's kind of like they say with comedy that all good comedy is surprise. It's that you don't know the punchline that's about to be said and that's why it's so funny is that the comedian has found the way to say something um, that uh, is not what you would expect. And when I look at these still lives by Mirandi, it is not what I would expect. And, the, and certainly there's a lot more to it than that, but that's one of the things that has always um, made me just gravitate to, to his work. Um, Richard Diebenkorn, uh, this is kind of a lesson on, so this is an actual street view photo that someone had tracked down of this scene that he had painted out in California. Uh, and to me, it just really does a good job illustrating uh, choices and feeling free to make choices within your paintings. Um, that your painting does not need to verbatim represent exactly what's in front of you. It, there are different ways. And it's okay if that is the way that you choose to create and what resonates with you, but there are other, other ways. And there is no right or wrong. There is, there is no yes or no. But uh, I, for a long time, was very locked in on um, feeling as if I needed to recreate exactly faithfully what was in front of me. And it, it, helped me to develop a lot of um, technique and it helped me learn to see and measure and helped with perspective. But then at a certain point, um, it was not enjoyable for me. <laughs> I was not finding joy in that. And I started to find joy in the freedom of interpretation. And I think Richard D. Bincorn really um, kind of shows the glory of interpretation, especially here. Uh, these are two separate artists. Uh, Lois Dodd, who's in her 90s, lives in Maine, um, pretty nationally renowned. And Zoe Frank, who's a pretty young contemporary artist, um, 
Uh, I think she's in, I believe, Denver, Colorado. But uh, to me, these both illustrate, um, it kind of goes against the rules. They say not to put your focal point in the center, but uh, they did it and it works. <laughs> um, and I think it's just about balance. Um, they found a way to balance things. Uh, Zoe Frank, this painting would be very different if the blind were not lifted on the right-hand side to create these triangles and these different shapes. If it were flat all the way across, it'd be a very different painting. And uh, it's a really interesting choice and it just served the entire painting really well. And here you have these beautiful flowers. Um, again, Lois Dodd is just a master at, at um, painting thin, painting slow. And uh, it's like she sees the next brush mark uh, like ahead of the next like it's and she knows just the right amount to put in and where to put it um and yeah uh, this is david hockney um uh this is kind of so different from a lot of the work that i was interested in and in that it's so many flat shapes uh, and of, of course there's subtlety within all of the colors it is not just one shade of blue in the sky, but it, for all intents and purposes, looks fairly flat, but yet says a lot, and it's just beautifully done. And this is a great David Hockney quote, who's going to ask a painter to see a diploma? They'd say, can I see your paintings, wouldn't they? Um, this did a lot for me as a, um, a self-taught artist. Uh, I did not go to school or receive any formal training. Um, and there are times where I wish I did and times where I'm perfectly content in the path that I've been on. Um, but this, this quote meant a lot to me when I read it. Uh, Hopper, Edward Hopper and John Singer Sargent. Um, this to me is just, these are two beautiful watercolors. I, I focused on watercolor for about better part of 10 years until the last couple of years I've been focusing on oils. Um, and these were certainly two of my North stars in uh, watercolor, but uh, I just love that there's no clear cut point of interest. It's kind of split amongst the composition and, but all working together really well. It doesn't feel like it's split, like there's competing sides. They're all very homogenous and working together. Uh, there's just no obvious focal point. Uh, I feel like you could ask a room of 100 people and get a lot of different answers of where is the focal point. So uh, Birch, Charles Birchfield, uh, Ohio native. Uh, this is, to me, this one's called Oncoming Spring. And I put that because uh, it said to me that sometimes titles can mean a lot. You don't need a, a perfect title. Some of my favorite paintings are untitled, um, but sometimes with the right piece, you're kind of deciding what you're cluing the viewer into, you know, what kind of piece of, of the painting you want to give to them. And when he says oncoming spring, it suddenly, it shifts you into seeing that time when really warm rays of sun are kind of beaming through. And that first time in the snow that you feel that warmth kind of coming and it really just changes the painting for you. And then, of course, you see it and you go, oh, of course, that's what it is. But uh, without the title, you know, you could see it very differently. Well, this is a Mary Potter painting. And this to me says, you can paint any subject, doesn't matter. And is how it's painted can really carry it. Because if you ask me to make a painting of a bird on a telephone line, I would normally stray away from it. But it is, it's beautifully done. And actually it made me think of, uh, I went to a workshop when I was first starting painting, a watercolor workshop. I won't say the artist's name. He's like a, a internationally re renowned watercolorist. And he said to the group when we got there that like, uh, he said something along the lines of, you're not here to paint ducks in a pond. We're gonna do something real. And I got what he was saying, but it rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't. I didn't like that. I didn't like that he was counting out a subject as if you couldn't make a good painting of ducks in a pond. But of course you can. Uh, so that was a lesson that I took from a workshop that was the opposite of what the instructor was trying to say.
Um, just a couple more. Uh, this is a local artist. I'm sure many of you know Fred Fotchman. He's a dear friend and he's been almost a mentor to me for uh, uh, since 2020. He's been very um, gracious with his time and gives me these three hour phone calls where we just talk about paintings. And, um, uh, and I remember seeing this painting of his and really what it said to me was giving you the license to just leave shapes in that are interesting just for the sake of having an interesting shape in there. It doesn't very clearly define anything, but yet I love these shapes. It's my favorite part of the whole painting. And you can't say for sure what's happening. It could be a dock or some posts sticking out of the water. Can't be sure, but it doesn't matter because it's beautiful. Uh, this is a Philip Gustin painting. And his work is like right on the edge of too abrasive for me, but somehow still fits in with what I enjoy and what I've sought out. And I was watching a documentary that my good friend Christopher Burke uh, sent to me. And one of the things that he said in it, it was showing him starting his process. And he said, at first it looks good and then you start doubting it, you know? And that really hit me because I don't know how many times I start a painting and I'm really interested and I'm really feeling good about it. And then so quickly that confidence just kind of fades away. Um, this painting, and they talk about it in the documentary, and it's so true, is all about these little tiny spaces that are popping through here. Without them, it'd be like suffocating, these like weird legs piled on top of each other. But the intentional little spaces here uh, give, give the painting depth and give you some breathing room, so. And then this is a painting, uh, my time at Open Door Art Studio. I had said I worked there for six years with uh, adults with disabilities. And uh, Doug Gant was an artist that I worked with a lot. And he had a profound effect on me um, and just the way that I saw value in, in different types of painting and different types of work. And what he taught me was to paint your passion because Doug is very passionate about history. And some of it is very true to the books and some of it is almost fabricated uh, for him. But this was like a uh, like a queen that was having her hair brushed and the guards by the castle. And the thing about Doug is you ask him about his paintings and he would just talk forever and ever about the story that was happening within these paintings. And he ended up having a show at the Lindsay Gallery um, in the short north and having a really successful show. And so I was very happy for him. And one of my favorite artists I got to work with uh, during my time at Open Door. Uh, okay, so I think that's most of me going through uh, that. I'll try to kind of pick it up a little bit, but this is all to say about influence. One of my favorite quotes, imitate and separate. Um, this is to show you a lineage of different artists. So on the left is Cezanne, on the right is Matisse. Uh, Matisse referred to Cezanne as a father of sorts and said um, that he looked up to him uh, completely. And you can see it in the work. But then as time moves on, his work changes. So now Matisse's work is on the left. On the right is Dievenkorn. Dievenkorn idolized Matisse and you see it come through in the work. But as time goes on, he starts to separate and find his own voice within, uh, within these paintings. Uh, this is the same idea. On the top is a Japanese woodblock print, which was very inspirational on the bottom to Vuillard and Bernard and all the like knobby painters in France. They drew a lot of inspiration from Japanese woodblock printing. Uh, and then Fairfield Porter on the right drew a lot of his inspiration from Vuillard. So it's this chain of people who are kind of speaking the same language over time. Um, and and trying to like learn and be a part of this language and through it comes their own voice. Um, on the left is one of the first artists that I showed, uh, Yael Scalia. On the right is Giorgio Morandi. You can see very clearly uh, the inspiration and, and Yael Scalia uh, quotes Morandi as being one of her biggest influences. Um, but then, you can see this is another one of her paintings. It doesn't nearly harken the same ideas as Morandi. This feels 
very different and very much her own. But it's okay that some of her work is a little more clear where her influence was coming from because eventually the work becomes hers. Um, on the left is Albert Ryder, and on the right is Albert York, who I showed earlier. This one is, it's a fine line, almost like uh, paying homage to, but he, he quoted the Albert Ryder as his favorite artist. You can see the snake in the bottom. Same thing showing up in his own paintings, you know, a century later. Um, and then here's uh, Mirandi on the left, and that's a painting of mine on the right. And this is to illustrate what I was looking at and how it worked its way into my own work. Um, something, one of the big takeaways I took from Mirandi was exploring empty space with brushwork and, and trying to be expressive. And so uh, what's happening here in this empty space, you can clearly see he was on my mind as I'm making the sky. Uh, it's in there. And trying to work with this kind of muted palette and this pink kind of shows up here and there. Uh, you know, and as I walk away, I can go, oh, maybe that was a little bit too Mirandi there. Uh, you have, essentially, what I'm after is that you have these whole school of artists who are just living in your head, hopefully. These artists that you've taken in and that you've loved and, and you've looked at their work and you've studied their work. And I think the best thing that you can do with influence is just add and keep adding to the stew. Uh, because they're all going to be in there kind of throwing out suggestions the whole time. And it's always best if there's, you know, eventually when I'm sitting down and making a painting, I'm not thinking about anything other than making a painting. And maybe sometimes one of these people will pop up and come through a little more. And in the end, I can go, um, yeah, that one turned out a little too much like Matisse or whatever, whoever it is that I've been really studying. But you can recognize that. And I think it's okay for that to happen because then sometimes you make a painting and you can't really pin it down on any of those influences. And hopefully that means that it's just you. It's just a painting that you've made and you've brought influence into it in a, in a healthy way. Um, so with that, all of that being said, I just wanted to show some of my current work and see where that has come from. And uh, so this is a piece uh, peering out of my in-laws living room window and um, several years ago I would not have painted this because I would have said who's gonna want to buy a painting of my parent in-laws window or it's to this or and I think one of the best things that came from um, the, the, not necessarily the pandemic but it came about during that time was that I just decided to let go of the idea of letting anything dictate the paintings I was gonna make other than my excitement to make whatever it was. And so if it was the window at my in-laws house, then so be it. And this is their backyard. Uh, at the bottom, I would say that I'm kind of utilizing some of those Fairfield border techniques. Like these flowers aren't really fully connected to the earth sometimes. And some of that's abstraction and some of it's just letting hopefully your eye get past it into the tree and the water in the back. Um, this is a beach scene. Uh, it was right in the middle of, of 2020 deep COVID times and we went to uh, Ogden Beach and it was pretty uh, not very populated and, and I took my sketchbook with me and I made some sketches and I came back and um, I had snapped some photos for like some color reference and then I did some of the painting just from imagination and I changed things around and uh, yeah and in the end I felt free to let this blanket just kind of go up at a weird angle not because it necessarily would do that but because it felt better for the composition. Um, this was a newer one I did of Holmes County in the fall. Um, you, you know, I chose not to put any windows or doors or anything on the structures. I liked the idea of just focusing on the sunlight hitting these broad shapes. Um, I always like, my favorite work is representative of reality, but also a little detached from it. 
and there is some abstraction happening and that's the work that i've been interested in so that's what's been popping up in my own work uh, this was two structures out near my family's um call it a farm it's essentially a farm that they live in uh you know some of these um they, like this almost could be like a, a cornfield or like you know a wheat or something but this is kind of a made up thing like really it was all green but there was i i felt like i needed something else to be happening there uh, and of course i exaggerated the shapes of the shadows to try to line things up in an interesting way uh this little line up here coming across it almost looks like a glitch in the matrix or something like it's some weird thing but i just liked it so it stayed um there was no chimney i put a chimney in and then these were going to be clouds and then i thought oh maybe it's smoke and that's just an example of just it started from reality and then eventually it just turned into something else and i let the painting just be whatever it wanted to be this is a newer one from my neighborhood in cleveland i did a lot of editing i removed a lot of buildings that were blocking this out um Vuillard pops up here doing a lot of dots with the paintbrush uh different trying to balance my mark making a little bit this one, uh, another example of, so this is in my backyard, but I promise you, I do not live by the coast. Uh, I live in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, but I made a blotch of blue and it almost looked like the water and I just left it. And I thought, well, that kind of gives this painting some depth, but the red umbrella and the chair and the table, those are all mine. Those are in my backyard. The thing that brought me to the scene was the shadow of the table. I really enjoyed the shape that it made. I like these little holes that were punching through. Um, yeah, that was a, a fun painting to make. Most of the work I've been doing has been starting from life and either finished directly from life or then inside the studio, back and forth. No direct route, just whenever it feels like it's done. This is again, Holmes County near my parents' place. I felt like this hill was kind of odd and it like cut off these structures here and I wasn't sure. Uh, originally there was green coming all the way here, but it felt like there was no path to the back. So I brought that color back in, um, you know, just different changes along the way. Uh, this was done at, this is a nocturne. This was a, a method that my friend Fred Fochman kind of talked about with me was he was doing a series of paintings and he said that he set up his stuff outside as the sun was going down. And by time the sun went down, he couldn't even see the paints. He was just kind of painting with intuition. He couldn't even see what colors he was using. But then you come back inside and you look at it and it's kind of surprising to you. And it's the closest thing you can get to being surprised by your own work because you can't really see what's going on until you turn the lights on. So that was, I brought it back in and I tweaked a couple things, but I kept it pretty true to what happened outside. Uh, this is my at my parents' place. They have a wood burning uh, stove. They heat and cook with wood. Uh, it sets a mood for sure, and I've always felt a lot of comfort in that space. Uh, this is their wood box, and their cat was sleeping. And I made a pretty involved sketch based off of that. Took some pictures for some color reference, and um, yeah, uh, this was just a little scene of some parked cars. Uh, I just. With this car back here, I think I made the car with like one brush stroke and I was happy with it. And I feel like someone said once, if you can do it in zero brush strokes, do it in zero. So I like that. Uh, this scene is completely fabricated. It didn't come from anything. I just, it was originally like a, a house and I scraped it away and it made this weird shape that looked like trees. And then I started carving into those. And then I thought it, oh, this kind of looks like a lake. And then I added a fire and then, and I just, and sometimes it's disorienting because I'm, I've spent my whole life going from either painting what's in front of me or from a reference photo. And I kept thinking, oh, let's refer back to the subject, but there was no subject. I was just making it up. So uh, I used to feel like I couldn't do that. And lately I've become okay with it. Um, this was just kind of a park the car on the side of the road and make a painting. Um, and this one was a cropper. I always, I highly uh, subscribe to, it's okay to make a painting and then cut out the little piece that worked. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's hard to, 
imagine that every single time you make a painting, you're going to get the composition exactly perfect on the space that you did. So I always do things that uh, this is on a panel. It used to be about twice as high and I cut it in half and that worked a lot better. Uh, and then these last two, I started doing some still lives. Uh, I enjoyed painting from life, but it was getting hard to do it at night. I've um, been watching my um, newborn a lot during the day. And uh, and then a lot of my painting time is at nighttime. And you can do a lot of nocturnes, but I just didn't feel like setting my stuff up outside. I was getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. So I just was like, I'm doing still lives. <laughs> like, at least I can still work from life and um, and not have to worry about that. So uh, this one was the first one I tried and I'm happy with some of it. I like the, this was a vase that I liked and a coffee cup that I hate, but it worked its way into the painting somehow. It was painted on top of uh, actually this, I'll show you. Oh, I don't know if you can see my camera, that's okay. It's, uh, it's just my um, like airtight, my palette. Um, one of those airtight ones. And it was this crazy red color. And the whole thing used to be red and it was just too much. It was offensive how much red and pink was happening. So I muted down most of it with the gray and let some of it show through. And then this is the last painting that I've made. This is a still life. Uh, my parents, I mentioned at the beginning, are antique dealers. And um, it occurred to me if I was doing still lives that I had access to just an abundance of beautiful, interesting objects. And so they let me raid. Uh, my dad has several barns curated with antiques uh, that he sells out of called Steve Stuff. And he just let me go through and bring home boxes of, of items to paint. And this crock pot on the left has always been, this was from their house. And this is one of my favorite things of theirs. And then this was just a glass jar that I found in the barn. And I've just been kind of interested in doing these pairings, like two things and the relationship between two things and the shapes that can happen. Um, and yep, so I'm gonna end on, there's me and my wife and my newborn and my son Olavo. And one of my favorite quotes from him, I was asking him what he wanted to listen to in the car because I wanted to listen to music. And he said from that, can we just listen to the wind? And uh, uh, he wanted to roll his window down and just listen. And I was like, yeah, that's going in my notebook. That's pretty adorable. Um, uh, but then he had another quote that I'll definitely end on. He kind of mixed up uh, uh, no time for chit chat. And he said, we have work to do. There's no time for Kit Kats, uh, which also has made it into the notebook. Um, that is all I got. Uh, and then I'll just open it up if anyone has any questions. I don't know how long we have here, um, but I will stop my screen share now. There we go. I just appreciate hearing how it's okay to make it more interesting. Yeah. Um, it, can, it can be really difficult mentally to get past certain roadblocks in the way. And I felt very, I was very aware of several roadblocks uh, in my work for a long time. And I feel like you work in, generally you have two, two spaces that artists often work in. There's the space of commissioned work where you are under the parameters of somebody else and you're working within their parameters. And then you're supposed to have the space of your own work, which there aren't supposed to be parameters really but they start to pop up and you start to go, oh, this isn't really gonna fit with the thing that I've been doing or that people have started to notice um, in my work or uh, no one's gonna relate to this or it's, it's not really marketable. So, or it's not of the city that I'm living in. All these things start to pop up um, and it can be really, it can be a, a task to get past that, but um, I think it's worth trying <laughs> for sure. And if anyone has any questions or comments, just feel free to um, say them out loud. I just want to comment on how much I appreciate the way you put your presentation together as you flow from artist to artist and we get to see the changes and then to come back to your own work, which I think is lovely. So thank you for doing that. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for um, 
for hanging around and listening. I, it's, it's a task to try to not become too self-indulgent on a presentation about yourself. So um, I tried to punt it over to other artists that were uh, way better. But then it turns into a situation of me showing all the best artwork that's ever been made and then my stuff. So I get to like, it's like Pink Floyd opening up for like a local band or something. So there's that problem, but it was the only solution that I could uh, come up with. I think your painting is a lot like jazz where oh. you, you take some, you go with a riff and make it yours. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love that. I've never had my artwork compared to jazz, and I would love for it to be compared to jazz more. <laughs> it just seems like. Yeah. Uh, well, so I've kind of been thinking about style as um, style being a language that you're learning. And then uh, it feels like the main goal that people, artists, often seem to be after, and that I've certainly felt like I was after for a long time, is like, I have to find my own voice. Like, I have to figure out that thing that's me, that's nobody else. And it's just such a strange task. And it's comforting to hear from all these artists who I've looked up to that it's not real. Like, it's not, it, that's not a, a, a real thing that just plops out of nowhere. Um, you're building off of the work of humankind, but you're building off of all of these artists along the way. And then somewhere you create some work that doesn't necessarily remind you of any specific person. And hopefully that's you. So the style is like a language that you're learning and you just take in as much as you can, wherever your interest is centered. So for me, I outlined where my interest is, where my visual interest is. There's a language there. It's not a specific singular artist. You can get pulled into it by a single artist. Edward Hopper pulled me into the language that then is all these other artists. He was kind of the first one that I came across when I was learning about painters. But then you find out, oh, there's an entire world of these, of this language. And then your voice is just, no matter what, your, your, the marks you make, your handwriting, uh, it's kind of like, you learn a language, but then the sound of your voice, the words that you choose to use, the new words you just learned, that's your voice, you know, that's the work that you're making. Um, and as long as you just have alarm bells that are up that like, you're aware that, oh, this came from, this probably came from this place, this came from this person, it's okay that that happens. Um, I think it's also good to always have it in mind, you know. Um, there was one other quote that I, I, I wanted to um, say, and it was actually about the, the first quote that I put out there from Wayne Thiebaud. Uh, but it was actually, I learned of it from uh, another Ohio artist, Frank Hobbs. Uh, and he said, um, or it was about a lecture from Wayne Thiebaud that he attended. Uh, and so he had said, a remark that Wayne made uh, was like a bomb blast to my youthful delusions about the issue of originality. He said, everything I do, I stole from someone else. And if you're not careful, I'll steal from you. And then he said, that sort of gracious self-deprecation and humility is not well taken in American culture, especially these days when there's a frenzy of self-promotion aided by technology. I thought that was a really great way to put that. It's like a lot of time is spent trying to cover up your tracks as an artist that as if the, the the work came plopped into your lap out of nowhere but it's good and healthy to talk about the people that inspire you and the, and the artists that you study and that you're passionate about um yeah so i loved that quote from him i wanted to ask you a question um sure. i always think of you as being the guy that did the wonderful watercolors with the uh, rainy day and the reflections. And um, now you seem to be doing more oil painting. I wondered why you switched mediums or, you know, got away from that rainy day. Scene. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And so 
Um, I guess the short answer on oils is that there's a kind of the technical side of it, which is um, I ventured into oils as COVID hit and I was home with my son at the time he was two. Uh, and so I was then in full-time stay at home dad mode. Um, and watercolors are very time sensitive. Uh, if you've worked with them, you know that if you're in the middle of a wash and then there's an interruption, it can ruin the entire painting it, or at least change it for better or worse, usually for worse. Uh, and so it's a stressor. It was very stressful for me to put my son to nap, try to go get a couple hours of work in and then not know when he could wake up in 20 minutes and then I would need to abandon what I was working on. Oils, you have the option for them to stay wet and workable as long as you like. So you step away and then you come back to them tomorrow and it's all the same. So just on the technical side, that's what I was like, well, let's try this out. Um, I had been kind of in love with watercolors and only living in that world for about 10 years. And I know that, and it's always there. It's like itching at me to like, hey, why don't you get those watercolors back out? <laughs> and I'm like, I will, just give me a second. Uh, so I, um, I did those just thinking like, I'll just do this for a little bit and then I'll get back to my watercolors uh, once, once I have kind of my own time carved back out more reliably. And then I just started loving oils and I started really becoming interested in, in figuring those out and seeing what connected to watercolor and what didn't. And um, so, yeah, so I just started down that path and I think about all the time, like, let's get the watercolors back out. And I know I will, but I'll, when I do is when I'll do it. <laughs> and right now I've just still been going down the path of, of oils. And then as far as subject matter, um, I actually just today I was standing, uh, I had put my daughter down for a nap and I walked into one of our bedrooms and there was a little, it was raining all day in Cleveland. I don't know if it was in Columbus, I assume, but uh, the kind of lookout on the roof was just drenched with water and there was these interesting reflections happening. And all I wanted was to get my paints and set up and, and work from that. Um, and, you know, again, I will always say there's no right or wrong way to make a painting, but I did make paintings from photographs from a very long time. And I switched to painting from life and it is very hard to go back um, because of the, the visual information you're getting is so different on a camera versus from life. And it's just, it's just a fact. So I can take a picture and I can do tricks, like take a panoramic picture to try to capture the space, but I, it, there's nothing that beats setting up my stuff. And I couldn't because I was in the middle of watching my daughter. But today I was like, oh, I really want to paint that rain, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's always there and, and I'll always return to it. But kind of like that Clarice Beckett painting that I shared earlier, um, I think I got away from the rainy scenes for a while because I felt like I had beat it to death. And, and I, was, I, was, I wasn't tired of doing them, but I felt I didn't just want that to be the totality of my work. Um, and if I wanted to paint it, I wanted to be moved by something to paint it. And that happened today. I just didn't have the opportunity to actually set up and paint, but it's still there. I still love it, you know. Well, a lot you. happens. <laughs> What was that? Uh, Joni, were you done? Yes, I said, you know, sometimes life makes us change what we're doing and that happens a lot. So Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Cody, How if you work with oil paints, have you experimented at all with using cold wax as your medium? Yeah, I use, I have it right behind me. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I use, I kind of go between a few things, um, but cold wax has become a staple because it, it creates that impasto, like really thick paint. And, and I'm very um, aware of the marks and if it's a little too marky, too many marks happening, it's, too, it's like distortion. Like you can dial it in, it can be a little too much distortion or it's a little too smooth. Uh, and so I'm very sensitive to the surface of it. And so when I feel like something needs texture in a spot, I use that wax. Um, and then 
But the other part that I've been trying to bring together is also treating them almost like watercolors. And so using like mineral spirits to thin it down to almost a watery texture and letting that happen too. Uh, for some reason, again, I, I've always just been figuring out things on, on the fly, just trying to learn through experimentation. You know, a teacher could have helped me out with this, you know, like if I would have just maybe signed up for some classes, it would have jump started uh, my understanding of the medium. But for some reason, my whole life, I just prefer to just try to figure it out. So yeah, I've been kind of trying to play around with, with those different watery, almost watercolor textures, and then the opposite, you know. Well, if you ever go back to watercolor, I'm curious to see how it's gonna change. It's probably gonna be different. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, one of the bigger things that, uh, so again, I, I felt myself kind of as the work progressed over the years, getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter uh, into, um, you know, a, a common uh, compliment uh, would be, it, oh, it reminds me very much of a photograph. I thought it was a photograph, which is the, uh, an incredibly kind thing for, for someone to say. And so it's odd that then as someone who's painting could internalize it as I'm doing things wrong, right? <laughs> because all I want is for it to look like a painting. And so if it looks like a photograph, I'm doing it wrong. And, and it, it's funny the things that can kind of get into your head. But somewhere along the way, I decided that uh, it wasn't just that. It was that I wasn't actually enjoying the process as much anymore. I was actually a little miserable as I was starting these really tight, intricate paintings. And for 70% of the process, I wasn't even enjoying what I was doing. And I, that was a big red flag that I needed to, I needed to just stop. And even if it meant I was going to confuse some people, <laughs> that it was probably the better path for me uh, to, for now, you know, and I've also learned I can't predict the future. So I don't know what will interest me in five years. You know, uh, all you can do is kind of go down the path that you're on and, and take a turn whenever it feels like the right thing to do. Keep exploring. So the, the, I think that compliment, it looks like a photograph. What people really mean is that you got the values right. Yeah. You nailed the values, which is, is a great compliment as a painter. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we can all relate to, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, but you know, something I would never say to a person is, is, is that, I, you know, like I feel comfortable talking about it in a group of artists and painters. I feel like that's a sentiment that a lot of people can understand is when you receive a compliment that is actually telling you the opposite of what you're hoping your work is doing. And the last thing you're going to do to someone who's just trying to participate in your art with you is like, put them down for, for saying something nice. Uh, but amongst some of my painter friends, you know, it became like a, a bit of a joke between each other, like, because we knew it would bug each other kind of thing. You have a kind of a favorite size you like to paint? Yeah. Um, I felt like every time I start in a medium, I start small and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and I gain a little confidence. And then, and somewhere you're always like, I got to do the biggest thing I can do. Like, I'm going to say something with this big piece. But I, I had a little bit of a just realization that I liked working smaller. Like I really enjoyed working. I, the last show exhibition that I did in Columbus, the biggest piece was probably like 16 by 20, maybe. And that was far and away the biggest piece. Everything else was like five inches, seven inches, 10 inches. They were all pretty small. And I found that I really enjoyed that for the time being. So right now, uh, I've done some large paintings, but kind of more by the request of, of a gallery or by someone else. But anytime I sit down just to do me, it's usually pretty small. It's, it's all within my eyesight, you know? Whereas other artists I know live for the idea that they paint as, as far as their arm can stretch, you know? And they like the physicality of being up and moving. And I can enjoy that too. Um, but right now, 
it's been resonating with me to paint small and try to try to get my message across as impactful as possible in um, a smaller scale. How do you stay motivated daily? Like, how do you how do you stay disciplined in? I mean, obviously, you have two kids that keep you extremely busy, but um, and I'm sure you kind of find time in between all of that craziness. But how do you stay disciplined as an artist in your everyday routine? Good question, and it's great to see you, Ashley. Thank you for, <laughs> for joining. Uh, Ashley Pierce is a wonderful uh, painter in Columbus. Uh, still in Columbus, right? Yes. Well, now, right now, I'm in Nebraska, but yes. Oh, Nebraska. Oh, that's right. You're on residency. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations. Um, uh, well, I've found that, as is the case with most creatives, is that uh, creative output is uh, pretty necessary. And with when it isn't happening for longer and longer and longer, it starts to become almost painful, like that nothing's getting out. And sometimes that can get into like a, not a great space where it's feeling more product based, like, oh, I've got to make stuff to make money to do this. And that's not fun, but more who you are. If you have found your way into the creative world, it's for a reason. It's because for some good segment of your life and probably your whole life, you've kind of felt this need to just get get the work, get something out, make something, you know, knitting or, or, you know, writing or anything. And so that's always there. And that's always the, the biggest motivator. But it is true that like, it's hard as your modes switch to then to then come to terms with the fact that I enjoyed a good year. I had a good year in 2017, where my work schedule was wake up, have coffee, work, paint all day with all my energy. And then at the end of the day, spend time with my wife and then go to bed and do that over and over. And it was so productive and it was wonderful. But then the reality is that I had children and children take all the energy that you have. Um, but within that, I still am a creative person and I'm still also responsible to bring in income as an artist. Uh, and so, uh, it's hard to then know that a lot of the time, especially like with a newborn right now, um, my work time tends to be in, at night. And uh, so that means coming, getting children to bed, coming down to the basement and trying to work with the last couple hours that, of the day. Um, and sometimes it's hard, but the biggest thing that I've found is that creativity is so much like exercise or at least my relationship with exercise, which is that it is really hard to, make yourself start. And then once you do, you're like, oh, I am so happy that I started. And so I just have to constantly tell myself that at the end of the day, when I know my time, I'm like ready to go to bed, but I feel like I need to keep making things. Uh, that it is like, it's like exercise in that regard. And so uh, it's important to hold yourself accountable uh, and get yourself to your space when the time is there to do it. And more times than not, if you just get yourself there, that's the hardest part. Just like starting your push-ups or whatever your exercise <laughs> routine is. I do a lot of push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's very true. Thank you. And I love your new work. I love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Ashley. Cody, yeah. your newest oil works seem to have just a lot of depth to them and they carry I don't know they seem to make their own worlds regardless of the subject size and they carry like a sort of moodiness to them too when you sit down and just start painting are you thinking of okay I'm gonna make a painting with this emotion or is it just kind of like I'm just gonna find something interesting hey Joe good to see you thanks for the thank you for the question um uh, so I think, uh, so Joe uh, uh, is a musician and, and has, uh, uh, so you probably understand um, how sometimes 
something just kind of arises out of nowhere and it's like a, a starting point and there you go and you've got something and then it, it's just it's in your hands and then, then it's just a matter of like of figuring it out and like uh getting it to work and then other times you just sit forever and and it's it's nothing's kind of numbing and and uh my process for getting started on a painting used to be having a bank of thousands of photos on my phone and just do 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 trying to find because I would come across something in nature and be like I'm struck either by the subject or the shapes or the color or whatever something it was there and but then it's a matter of trying to reconnect with that later and I found that to be really frustrating that I would be sitting here in my space scrolling through a screen trying to recapture that inspiration and so that's one of the things that I've kind of tried to kick and once I've realized that working from directly from life has has meant more to me and every time and so it feels a lot better to just wander around outside looking at stuff with my paints and stopping and making something just sometimes on a whim, sometimes I know there's a place that I want to go back to. And I'm like, I know that there was something there and I'll set up. But once anything is a, a possibility for a painting, it's wonderful, but it's daunting because now everything's a possibility for a painting. And it's like narrowing down and picking something out. Uh, so sometimes it's just a matter of like, I just set my stuff in a spot and I'm like, whatever's happening today, especially when I'm on a time restraint, I go, I need to get started. I'm setting down my stuff. Anything in my 360 degree view is, is par for the course, but that's where I'm working today. And that helps, that helps me hone in on what I'm gonna do. Um, and then, uh, and that's the starting point. And the starting point is almost the hardest thing to find most of the time. And then from there, I, I, I kind of mentioned earlier that I've become comfortable with the idea that just because it started there doesn't mean that's where it needs to finish. So if I bring it back to my studio, I feel free to forget what it was that got me started and just start having a relationship with the painting itself. And if I feel there needs to be a different structure or, or more depth or it's lacking something, then I make those changes and you just kind of, I start to trust um, that process. And it's a, it's, been a big process shift from the difference of for many years, take photo, now translate photo to painting. Like, okay, this tree is on the upper third. Now let me sketch that on this third. Oh, that doesn't look, something's wrong with that. And uh, that's a very, that's translation, which I enjoyed for a long time until I didn't enjoy it anymore. And I, I, I wanted something different. Um, so that's kind of been become the process through which the, the paintings emerge. Um, and uh, as far as the depth of emotion and connection and story that I get with it, uh, sometimes it does come from the objects themselves. Sometimes I am picking up a pot that is my dad's that's been in my house my whole life. And it is so fun and such an experience to paint this thing and really connect with it. And next to it is a jar that I just met yesterday and means nothing to me. <laughs> like, um, so it, it, I'm just, I try to be open to whatever it is that's in front of me. Um, and that's been better for, I think for me uh, in the last, in this more recent work. Very cool, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Do you have an email address or a way to contact you? Yes, absolutely. Um, my website is uh, my name, codyheichel.com, C-O-D-Y-H-E-I-C-H-E-L. And I have my email address on there and all my, you know, Instagram and all those social media platforms too. And always happy hearing from anybody about anything at any time and any questions. Um, about it doesn't matter what uh, I'm. I always enjoy speaking and, and having conversations about art of, of all art forms. Um, I've I spent enough of my life in the music world um, and in the painting world, and I, I I love stand up comedy with a passion, and I would never ever dream to like work towards that. But I love stand up comedy. Um, obviously uh, 
um, like movies and film. And I've just come to realize how interconnected it, it, it's all the same thing. It's all the same people. It's just the different medium that attaches to that person. And within that medium are all the different, all the different variations of that medium of painting, of, of visual art, of sculpture, of whatever. Uh, and so it's all very connected and it's all a lot of fun to talk about with anybody else who's a, uh, in tapped into that same creative world and has those same interests. So I welcome any conversations and emails and uh, I enjoy it. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Cody. I This is my first um, actual Zoom meeting and I your whole lecture discussion was very empowering. Uh, especially to say, you you know, my previous work was in healthcare doing psychotherapy. So, yeah. but I always knew I needed this part. Like you said, you have this need, you yeah. know, you can do it. But my whole point was I was going to do this once I finished the one career, you go to a new career kind of thing. It's like, yeah. okay, I think my time's getting, uh, I got to start it now, you know. But um, so, and I actually lived in the same place as I lived in Worcester. Lived in Cleveland Heights. Oh wow! <laughs> Live, I've been yeah. I've been like following behind you as well. I love this. Yeah. So your subject matters uh, touch a lot of areas that I love living in there. Those same areas. But I just want to thank you for everything you said and your ease with which you shared it was just fabulous. So you should definitely stay on the circuit. You know, <laughs> public speaking. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's Excellent great job. Kind of you. I um. I used to, yeah, that's been a, that's been a path of its own is, is getting used to um, talking about art in a public setting. Um, but I, yeah. I was putting together this little lecture and I was like, what is this reminding me of? Why, why is this feeling so familiar? And then I realized my time at Open Door when I, I worked there, we had a thing called Awesome Time, which was uh, the end of the day, we would put, uh, we would switch. Uh, there were about five of us, and it would be someone's turn every day to give, essentially, some kind of lecture about something fun, art related. And I was, I was like, oh, it's awesome time. I'm doing awesome time. That makes it easier. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your awesomeness with us. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank I, you so much. One of the things I wanted to mention that touched on something you said. When we have a member show and we see the people that we know and, and all their work kind of displayed in one place, it's fabulous just to see all the different uh, takes and interpretations and, and just in, within our relatively small group. So um, I think you kind of touched on that idea of just, it, it's awesome to see. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, um, it was uh, a joy to be able to kind of see see all of you and be able to talk with all of you. And I'm, I'm really glad for the invite and very appreciative. Um, and yeah, happy, happy painting. Very interesting. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.